this is my pleasure to uh, invite you to join the second day of Maniview Symposium, the fourth uh, annual Maniview Symposium. Uh, Perry Merling uh, from uh, Boston University is going to give us a, a presentation of his very new, uh, uh, almost uh, published paper. Uh, and then Gonzalo Fonseca is going to discuss it. Uh, Perry, the floor, the floor is yours. Okay, um, let me just share my screen here. I have some PowerPoints. Okay. Um, move that around so I don't block myself. Okay. Um, so uh, yes, so I'm calling this um, uh, Badges Classical Money View um, and uh, subtitle A Reconstruction in the paper itself. The paper is available right now as a working paper on the INET website, um, along with a little blog post to try to publicize it. Um, and uh, and I, it's not yet published. And I think that substantively though, it, it won't change very much. So uh, these are arguments I'm prepared to stand behind, the large arguments. Um, they, there may be some minor details to, and hopefully Gonzalo will be helping me with that. Um, I'm really very excited to hear what he has to say about this. You know, Gonzalo, to my mind, is, is the one who, who knows more about the history of economic thought than anybody uh, in his generation, um, and maybe even my generation. Um, so I look forward to that. That was a very good selection for a for a, a, a commentator. Let me just tell you where this paper came from. Um, I really wouldn't have written this paper. Um, I tried to get somebody else to write it. I was on the scientific committee of this of this history of economic thought conference that was going to do 150th anniversary. Uh, of the of New of Lombard Street, which is 1873. So 2023, they are having a meeting in France, and I thought, well, okay. Uh, then nobody wrote the paper that I wanted them to write, and so I agreed to write it. So I wrote it really in a rush at the last minute to give to the to give to the uh, conference, and then I worked on it some more over the next summer. Um, and then I got some comments on it. I worked on it some more. So this paper really has been produced really in, in within the last year. Um, I had done, I had of course read Lombard Street before. I had read other stuff, um, Universal Money when I was doing Kindleberger. I had read, uh, but I read more. Um, and uh, and and then I found out that Badgett it wasn't who I remembered him. You know, when I when I had read Lombard Street when I was a young man. Um, and so the paper became a much bigger deal than I had originally intended. I thought it was just, I felt a responsibility, you know, to represent the money view, I guess, a little bit at, at this at this conference. And then it turned into a much more serious contribution than I had originally intended. Um, so here we go. Here's the main point that I say. I say that it's difficult to for most people to read Badgett, okay, because they what we think we know what he is, right? Because Bernanke told us, you know, or or Kindleberger told us, um, and it's about lender of last resort, um, and that's the story, okay. Um, and it's people who read Badgett today, it's very hard not to read him through a neoclassical frame, through the frame of national income accounting, and through a professional academic uh, frame, because that's who we are. You know, that's our frame of reference, but but it's important to appreciate that that was not at all. None of those things were on offer back in Badgett's day. And so I want to read Badgett um, as a contemporary would have read him um, and as he was intending to be understood. Um, and so we need to understand that he was a classical economist, very much influenced by Ricardo, especially and Mill. Um, that he was living in, in, in and, and classical economics was very international. A lot of it was because Britain um, had such a role in the international economy. Um, and so he is not thinking about advising the prince, you know, advising the modern nation state with a stabilization goal. That's not at all how he's thinking. He's thinking about managing the international monetary system. Um, and, uh, and he's himself a practical banker. There really isn't much in the way of professional academia at this time. He's a professional, he's a professional banker at Stuckey's. Um, and, uh, and he also is the editor-in-chief of, of The Economist, the same economist that we read today. And there's a little, little of course, uh, uh, column in The Economist called Badgett in his, in his memory. And I, when I was reading him, 
pr probably because I'm reading him through the lens of Charlie Kindleberger, because I just finished the Kindleberger book. And I Kindleberger wrote a review of the collected works of, of Badgett. And I think he read quite a bit of Badgett. Um, and I was reading him through, and I could just see he seems to be a money view guy, Badgett, you know, more than I had thought when I read him 20 years ago, but that was before I really developed the money view. So of course I couldn't see that. I was reading him through the lens of my teachers. Um, that there's endogenous instability, there's he's a key currency guy. You, you know, you can if you read him through a money view lens, I think you will see that it is there. I'm not making this up. Okay. Um, he's a journalist, however. And so the analytical sharpness that you might expect, you know, is not there. So you have to read, you have to bring that a little bit there. So this is the bottom line. Um, so I'm going to read Lombard Street in context. Okay. And there are five contexts in the next five slides. Okay. The first is to read him in context of the stuff that he published, sort of the big, big books that he published before Lombard Street, 1873. Um, and the big book that he intended to publish after Lombard Street. Okay, so the big books that he published before Lombard Street were the English Constitution, um, uh, in which he talks about the three main institutions of the, of the British of the British uh, political system: the cabinet, the monarchy, the House of Lords, the House of Commons. Um, and then he follows up with a kind of analytical text called Physics and Politics. This is a sort of theory of politics. Um, I suggest that he was trying to do the same thing now with money, that Lombard Street is like the English Constitution, that he's trying to identify the three main um, institutional, the four main institutional structures, the Bank of England, the joint stock banks, the private banks, the bill brokers. You can sort of see a hierarchy of money there. This is the order in which he presents them. Um, and then he wanted to follow up with an analytical text, economic studies, um, but he died. OK, um, and he never got much more than a few a few chapters of that, which were put together. He died actually in 1877. So the, the economic studies is posthumous. Um, and it's just the, the bits of it that he that were collected by his friends. Um, so we need to read it in context. What was he trying to do in Lombard Street? He was moving toward a book called Economic Studies. OK, and 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 we need to understand that. OK, second context. He, he was writing in 1873, but he's writing in the context of, uh, of a previous work, Universal Money, 1869, in which he's afraid that the world is passing Britain by, okay? that, the, uh, uh, that um, there's going to be a German, a German, French, Latin, a Latin order. And in fact, the pound sterling is going to be left out to dry. But that didn't happen. In 1870, the Bank of France suspended convertibility. And then the war, uh, the French indemnity that was owed to, to Germany, they paid it by floating a huge loan in London. And it was paid to Germany with bills on London. This put the Bank of England right in the center of the international monetary system as, as, bank, as central bank of the world. Okay. And he wrote Lombard Street, I argue in this piece, okay, because he's afraid that the Bank of England is not ready to be central bank of the world. Um, that it's this parochial little institution that was dealing with England, and it's not really ready, okay? That, that the fact that the city of London was able to float this, the largest loan ever, you know, the French indemnity, means the city's ready for it, but the Bank of England is not ready for it. That's the problem. Um, and uh, so that's his main message in Lombard Street uh, from that point of view. He follows up by this, this shorter paper, a shorter, shorter book called Depreciation of Silver, where he's worried that the appreciation of gold that's coming from the fact that Germany is using these bills to, to acquire gold, to go on and have a gold currency, is causing gold to appreciate relative to silver. And the rupee, you know, which is part of the empire, um, is a silver standard. And so this becomes a big political issue. So I'm putting it in context here of what's happening exactly at the moment that he is writing, that it looks like the pound sterling is becoming universal money. Okay. Uh, and he wants, he thinks that's a good thing, but it's a challenge for the central bank. Here's the third context. So this is his biography. So he was born in 1826. Um, I point out in the paper that his juvenilia, you know, when he was 22 years old, okay, he wrote about the Bank of England currency monopoly and Mill's principles of political economy, that he is, um, uh, and he's also a practical banker. He, he joins uh, Stuckey's uh, bank, uh, his, his, his father's bank, um, in 1852, 
Um, and uh, so he is already thinking about classical, he's well-trained really as a classical economist, as a student, okay? So he's as old as many of the people on this call and he's writing his first papers. So I'm thinking about that when I see the papers of the, of the young students, you know, on, 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 in, this, in this conference, you know, who's the future Badgett here? Um, that they're, uh, and then uh, he gets married in 1858. I'm putting there Darwin, Origin of the Species, so that you see the context. You know, this is, these are the, these are the books that are influencing people of, of his time. He becomes editor of The Economist in 1860 because his father-in-law dies. Okay. And so he becomes the, who, who was the editor of The, of the Economist? And, and he makes that his base um, for talking to the world. Um, he wants, like Ricardo, he wants to run for parliament, um, and, but he is un unsuccessful. Um, and so it's the economist that becomes his voice to the world. Um, and uh, Lombard Street, I point out, uh, is 1873. Economic studies was projected to be a kind of work of retirement or that, uh, that he was going to spend 15 years on it. And there was three volumes, you know, so this was his major treatise, you know, that he's imagining he's going to do. Um, and it's 1877, however, he dies, okay, he is, do the math, 51 years old, okay. Um, I was 50 years old when I wrote New Lombard Street, okay, so I have a certain sense that of the ticking of the clock, you know, that he was, you would never have me here today, okay, um, if I if I had followed Badgett's route, okay, and died after New Lombard Street, Um Hopefully, I'll be able to write my own economic studies um, in the next book, uh, which I'm going to talk about tomorrow. Um, here's another context. Here, you need to understand um, what the Bank of England looks like at this time. It was, it was, it, it's divided into the issue. Many people on this call know this, but I'm just reminding you that it's divided into the issue department, that the notes were supposed to be on the margin, 100% backed by gold. Um, you couldn't issue new notes unless you had more, more gold. Um, and there's the banking department, which is using these notes as its reserves um, and, it, and is doing discounts and advances um, against collateral, often console collateral, government, government security collateral. Um, what's important to appreciate is that the Bank of England is, if you, if you just think about this balance sheet, okay, it is involved in both money markets and capital markets, okay, that the, that the famous liquidity of the of market liquidity of consoles has to do with their acceptability of as collateral at the Bank of England, okay? It's involved with both private counterparties and public, you know, counterparties. I mentioned uh, in, uh, in, in the Q&A um, of, of an earlier talk, okay, that, that, that Badgett gets credit for creating the treasury bill, um, but he didn't create the treasury bill. What he did was to say, how can we, he's thinking of banking as a matter of discounting of commercial bills you know, 30 day paper, 90 day paper that is financing trade, not only internally, um, but externally, that's my third bullet, bullet point. Um, how can we get the government into this act? Okay, the treasury bill is the answer. Okay, um, instead of these exchequer bills and so forth, let's make something that looks like a commercial bill, looks as much like a commercial bill as possible. Um, and then it can be a good bank asset um, so that it comes, it matures in a short period of time. Um, that shows him being a practical banker and applying that to government finance. Um, note that the Bank of England is, is a domestic central bank, but it's also the international central bank, um, that, the, that the bill market in, and also the capital market in London are the bill market and the capital market for the world. So to the extent that the Bank of England is operating as backstop for that market, it is, it is already the central bank of the world. That means that when there are crises, and if you read looking for these crises in, in Lombard Street, 1847, 1857, 1866, this is the actual period of Badgett's adult life when he's learning about the monetary system. He's watching all of these crises. He's writing about them in, 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 in The Economist. Um, and he emphasizes that in each one of these crises, we, the, the, the Peels Act was suspended, but there was never suspension of cash payments. He, make, he emphasizes that. I don't think people have noticed that in, 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 Long, in, in Lombard Street. What does that mean? Suspension of Peel's Act means that, you, that, the, that the issue department can create more notes okay, without having gold backing. That's what suspension of Peel's Act means. That means that they can use all of the gold to make payments abroad. All of the gold that's backing the note issue is available for making, that's what he means by cash payments. 
Um, and that's supporting the 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 value of of the pound sterling. Um, and uh, so there's an internal and an external drain at the same time in these crises. And and the the famous uh, budget rule we call it, um, which is lend lend freely in a crisis against collateral that would be good in normal times at a high price. Okay, the high price is intended to protect protect the gold. Okay, to give foreigners an incentive to leave their gold in London because they get a high interest rate on it. Okay, um, and the lend freely part is 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 about exp using the the Bank of England's balance sheet to provide means of payment for in, in the domestic in the domestic market. So here's the final context, which is I think maybe most interesting for this audience, okay, which is that he's writing Lombard Street in 1873 at the very moment of the birth of what became neoclassical monetary orthodoxy, okay? Um, and I speak particularly of this book by William Stanley Jevons, Money and the Mechanism of Exchange, um, in which he pr proposes um, that the, the problem that the international, that for England, the problem is that the gold standard does not stabilize the price level, okay? And that has caused problems in terms of, of, of distribution between debtors and creditors, you know, that if the price level changes during the period of the contract, somebody loses, either the debtor or the creditor. And if for inflation, okay, it's the creditor who loses. So it'd be nice to have a tabular standard, some way of adjusting these contracts. This is Jevons' argument. Um, in order in order to avoid these frictions between debtors and creditors. I think another reason why he wants to stabilize the price level is to avoid frictions between capitalists and workers. You know, that the real wage, if, 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 if the way, if prices rise, then, then the nominal wage um, stays the same, then real wages fall and the, and the workers are gonna go on strike or something like that. So he wants to stabilize the price level and realizes that the gold standard does not do that, that stabilizing the, the pound sterling against gold. And so he wants to have some, and this, he was proposing the tabular standard. This evolved into the notion that the central bank should be using interest rate policy and so forth in order to stabilize the price level. But this was its origin right here in 1875. And Badgett wrote a review of this book in 1875 in The Economist, I'm showing you in the left, in the left hand part, um, which was, you know, lauding it, saying, oh, what an interesting book and so forth. He had helped Jevons get his first job because Jevons' first first book had been about gold, okay? And uh, and so he thought, well, here's an academic that I can support, you know, because he's in favor of the gold standard. Um, and now he sees Jevons deviating and he writes a critical review, in fact, um, if you read. And here, uh, and, and, and I'm gonna say something about that critical review, but let me just, since it's Gonzalo here, here's a history of thought puzzle that I came across in writing this paper that I don't talk about in the paper, okay? Um, but maybe somebody knows the answer to this, and if not, maybe somebody wants to research it and publish it. This Economist article, which was published in 1875, okay, was published anonymously, um, as most articles in The Economist were and are, in fact, to this day, okay? Um, they, it was republished posthumously, okay, um, in the Economic Journal in 1892, okay? Um, and um, I believe it was Giffen who, who arranged for it. Uh, I need to check on that. Um, later on, 18, 1965, St. John Stavas, it was, a, it was a lord, and he, he took on the project um, to spend 20 years, you can see, um, creating all these volumes of the collected works of Badgett um, and collecting all of his columns on the money market. There are three volumes that are just about money, but there's also the political volumes, there's the historical essays, there's his essays about Shakespeare, there's his correspondence. It's a very comprehensive work. And that does not include this 1875 article. Why not? Why not? Um, maybe he overlooked it. You know, if you read this article, it starts with a long quote by Jevons, okay? You might, think that this was just, you know, somehow an excerpt that we're, we're reporting on the existence of this book, okay? Um, but he should have known about the 1892, you know, in, in, in the econo Economic Journal. So maybe that a uh, second hypothesis, maybe he suppressed it. Maybe he's courting acceptance. He, he obviously is a fan of Badgett, right? He's spending all this time. He wants Badgett to be loved by modern economists. Modern economists have been dismissing Badgett as nothing but a journalist. 
he thinks that Badgett is is really the a great thinker and needs to be appreciated, and he's spending his life putting these collected works out there. Um, so maybe he suppressed it. Maybe, maybe he thought it was written by somebody else because it was anonymous. Um, but he published a lot of other things in the Economist that were anonymous that he identified because they sound like Badgett. He said there's a characteristic writing style. Let me tell you, if he re if you read this article you will understand this is, it, it, is, it sounds like Badgett. It does sound like Badgett. Um, and here's what he says. I, sh I referred to this um, yesterday in my keynote address. Um, these are his crit critics, crit criticisms of, 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 the, of, the, um, of, the, of the book. Uh, he says um, that the tabular standard is wholly unfit for a nation which has a foreign trade. So here you see he's taking international point of view from the very beginning. A forwarder wants payment in a medium he can use in his own country, which the pound sterling is not, okay? Um, and uh, second, it would make banking impossible. So he's a practical banker. He's saying, if, if you're adjusting all of my assets and liabilities because price level is changing, um, I never know what I, I, I can't, I, I'm worried about cash inflows and cash outflows in, and, and, and if you start changing those things, you know, just because the price of wheat changed, um, then I don't know how I can run my business. Okay. Third, it'd be necessary to preserve the, you know, to calculate all these data that we know how to do. He, that would have been a problem in 1875. Um, and lastly, you know, what, what in a good currency, the paying medium ought either to be identical with or readily interchangeable with a definite quantity of the standard of value because um, Jevons was not proposing that we get rid of the gold standard at that moment. Okay, that's the standard of value. Okay, he was proposing that we that we change um, that we that we index essentially all monetary debts. Um, so uh, using these calculations of the price level, um, and uh, that's the origin of neoclassical monetary economics. It's also the moment. When so and and La David Laidler makes this point. Um, David Laidler was uh, has read this and given me lots of good comments on it. it. Was in fact David Laidler who drew my attention to this 1892 um, uh, uh, article, which I didn't know about because I had been reading the collected works, <laughs> not not the not the Economist. Um, and and he represents it as the as the foundation as the first blast of the golden age of the quantity theory. This is academic. You know, building on bu building uh, and Marshall and so forth af after this. Um, so academia, and he says, and I think that's correct, that that academic monetary economics sort of builds in its own kind of internal logic after this. It's not really paying that much attention to what's happening in the world. They're building they're building theories, and Marshall has this 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 book. On, on money too, which is published only much, much later, but it's what he's teaching to all of his students. They're really in a vacuum over there at Cambridge. Meanwhile, you know, the Bank of England becomes the central bank for the world and, and sterling is, is, is global money. That's so I'm contrasting the story, the, the economic history story, like what happened to the international monetary system. That's what Marcello de Checco talks about, money and empire, um, Claudio Ferri was mentioning in the last session. Um, the International Gold Standard, 1890 to 1914, is the subtitle there. So the International Gold Standard came after Badgett was dead, you know, but it's very much the sort of thing that he saw starting to happen, that it was being launched by that, by the French indemnity, and we needed the Bank of England to be able to, to, to manage. He saw this happening, um, and he thought it would be a good thing if we could make it go. The academics are not paying attention to that at all, okay? They're, they're trying to build a proper monetary theory, and it's the golden age of the quantity theory. Um, there were some academics or quasi-academics, I'll call Hawtrey a quasi-academic, um, who tried to maintain contact you know, with what's happening in the real world. So currency and credit, which became actually the best-selling um, uh, textbook, um, 1919, um, he is definitely paying attention to what's happening in the world. And the art of central banking um, in 1932 you know, is talking about the Wall Street market crash and so forth. Um, Keynes, I think the treatise on money is also engaged with the actual fa facts of practical banking. Um, and Sayers at the LSC, central banking after badges. So there are some in the British central banking school who are trying to maintain contact with the realities of, 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 uh, uh, 
of, of banking, I would say that Marshall kind of never was, you know, and, and so what's being taught to the students, if, if it's taught to Marshall, is sort of uh, his version of the quantity theory of, of money. Um, and uh, in America, you know, one of the things about the, the collapse of sterling after 1931 meant that the baton, who's the, who's the lead currency, who's global currency, passes from sterling to the dollar. Um, and so in the United States, you see a, another tradition of, of people trying to make that bridge between academia and practical banker banking. And I, and I emphasize John H. Williams as kind of an origin of that. Um, this is an article that he, that it's actually a talk that he gave in 1933 at the World Economic Congress in, in, um, in, in, in London, which was an attempt to put the gold standard back, put the international monetary system back together again through a system of central bank um, cooperation um, after the fall of sterling, the dollar was going to step up. That turned out to be a political non-starter for Roosevelt. So it never happened. And we had a Great Depression and we had a world war. Um, and the uh, Dupre was a student of Williams um, at Harvard as an undergraduate. Um, and he's working at the Fed um, with Kindleberger starting in 1938 um, with on, on this um, the tripartite uh, 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 agreement, um, which was stable, which was supposed to stabilize the pound sterling against the dollar with the addition of the, of the franc. Nothing much came of this because World War II broke out, um, but that was in the minds of the central banker bankers um, and that uh, going into Bretton Woods. And so, and so Dupre and Kindleberger see they're the, they're the keepers of the flame of the key currency view um, in, in America. Um, minority view, as as Kindleberger says in that famous 1966 uh, article, um, and uh, I particularly mention um, Hicks um, as as a bridging operation. So this is a Brit who is point who who sees the same logic. Um, his last book he ever wrote, A Market Theory of Money, and in my keynote yesterday, I wanted to build on Hicks. Um, so here, last two slides. Um, Epigram by way of conclusion, and or maybe a money view agenda. So this is a quote from economic studies. So this is Badgett um, trying to lay out, I think, the what he's trying to do in, in, in this book that he never got to write, okay? He says, political economy is an abstract science which labors under a special hardship. Those who are conversant with its abstractions are usually without a true contact with its fact. That's the academics. Those who are in contact with its facts have usually little sympathy with and little cognizance of its abstractions. That's the banker. And so the theory of business, by which he means um, academia, academic economics, leads a life of obstruction because theories, theorists do not see the business and the men of business will not reason out the theories. Far from wondering that such a science is not completely perfect, we should rather wonder that it exists at all. I take that to be a lovely statement of, of, of the challenge of the money view, where we're trying to bridge that gap. That's exactly what we're trying to do. And Badgett is saying, <laughs> it's amazing that it exists at all. So this conference is, is, is kind of amazing. Um, so here's uh, my last slide, that the money view idea is that the monetary financial institutions are the material infrastructure of the market economy, okay? This is a very different point of view than the, the veil idea, okay, which by the way, is sort of both Marshall and, and both Marx and the anti-Marx, which is Marshall, um, except they think of money as a veil um, over the real economy and that as scientists, they're gonna pierce this veil, look through to the real stuff lying under, underneath. That's how money got kind of pushed into, pushed out of, of, of economics. Um, that that conception of the project of economics, which was on both sides. Okay, um, here's a quote from my paper. I say in Badgett, which is which is trying to describe um, his view in 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 uh, economic studies. He says um, in Badgett, the central agency is not so much the capitalist shifting his own capital, but rather the capitalist banker shifting it for him by accepting the bills offered by the rising capitalist and denying the bills of the declining. For him, the alchemy of money is a sort of free variable, accounting for the dynamism of the market economy um, on an extensive margin spreading across the world and also intensive margin, which he lived that, that world. Um, here's the reason that English political economy is becoming more true 
uh, for better or worse, it's extending over the face of the globe because the Bank of England is where the world capital market is. And, and I mean, in London is where the world capital market is. And America is particularly the next area where it's extending to, um, he sees. I, I, my last bullet point is, is, is more just a, a kind of a, a, a tickle. Um, I, I point out in the paper that the, the quote in, in Lombard Street, the badge it talks about the infamous um, liquidity of the console market that you can even sell these British, you know, n perpetual bonds. Um, even even on a Sunday, you can sell these consoles. Um, it's important to I think to appreciate that in Badgett's day, which he says there was a, a, a bi monthly settlement in the you could buy them, but the actual settlement is only twice a month um, when you get together. So there's a lot of credit in, involved in this in this in this system. Um, and that's worth, I think, taking into account when you hear modern push for using technology like tokenized deposits and all of that stuff to push for T plus zero, you know, that in fact, get the get all the credit out of the settlement system um, and have it and have no trust at all. You know, this this image that we get from crypto um, about the possibility um, is is ignoring what Badgett knew very well that the that the monetary system is a balance between the elasticity of credit and the discipline of settlement. For Badgett, credit is a feature, not a bug. Okay, and so it is for us as well. That's it. Thank you, thank you so much, Barry. It was a wonderful presentation. And uh, again, this is uh, your working paper is available. Uh, the Institute for New Economic Thinking's web page. And uh, talking about web pages, let me invite uh, Gonzalo Fonseca, the creator of the History of Economic Thought uh, web pages, which is great. Uh, Gonzalo, please uh, discuss uh, Perry's working paper. You have 15 minutes. Thank you. Uh, is it possible to share screen? Yes. It's just down at the bottom. Yeah, I don't know if everybody can see that. There it is. Yep. Okay. Um, so I, I really enjoyed this paper. Um, it's, it was a bit like your presentation, as you said, had an extra bit on the new standard of value, uh, which was not in the original paper. So I didn't have much credit on that. Um, but I like the thrust of it. Uh, the main point being, uh, and this is the part I could be skeptical about, is the way you try to connect what budget in a, in a context of the history of, econ of economic theory at the time, rather than just being an institutional describer, actually putting him in, in a theoretical context, um, which is sometimes a little dangerous because it's, it's, it's a bit conjectural. So in a sense, you're going out on a limb a little bit, but I like it. And I think you should go out on the limb. <laughs> I think this is exactly the kind of thing that, and it forced me to think a little bit about, okay, where would one place? Badge in this context, in, in, the, in the theoretical context of time. So, just maybe summarizing the, oops, make sure it's right. So, you summarizing. Can, you can just um, do run the slideshow mode there if you want. Okay. Might be because it'll be bigger on the screen for us. Okay. All right. Um, so, just a, a couple things on 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 background. Um, you covered pretty much all of it. I'm just putting a couple more details. Um, like, like you mentioned, he was from a banking family. His father worked at Stuckey's, but he didn't actually study banking. He studied law, and um, and he was at the UCL. And he actually was called to the bar, but decided you know to go into banking at that point in time. And uh, his time at UCL, so he got his BA 46 and 48, is actually going to be important in a minute. In a minute. His review of Mill was sort of the first, and you talk about this, his, his review of Mill as being his first uh, early work on, on economics. And then through the 1850s, he's working basically as a banker, but he's also a literary reviewer. Um, and sometimes people forget, you know, he's writing on Shakespeare, he's writing on, you know, a whole bunch of, uh, liter in, in literary magazines, and he's actually an editor for a literary magazine before he stumbles onto The Economist and then his whole career uh, in the 1860s and 70s, uh, you know, writing his two columns a week, if I'm not mistaken, that was his pace. 
Now, in your paper, you talk about the transformative influences of things that were really influential on, on, on Badge's way of thinking. Um, first, what you point out that he was a country banker with that practical experience at Stuckey's. Um, and that you do that really nicely. I, I really like um, sort of, uh, when you talk about sort of the structural deficit, structural um, uh, surplus, uh, both domestically and internationally, just that way of thinking about what his function was. The other transformative analysis was the crisis of 47, 57, 60, 60, two of the three financial crises he went through in his life and experienced. And the French indemnity part, I actually found very, very interesting. So I, I never actually thought too much about that, but you sort of advertise that as sort of the beginning of the gold standard and sort of a moment when he moves away from thinking purely nationally to sort of thinking internationally, uh, which is... Um, which is very, it was very instructive, and and I, and I apologize. I mean, I've always sort of a, you know put Badgett sort of like an institutional writer, and not really thought too much about where his influences were coming from, uh, both from an economic history point of view, but also from a history of economic thought point of view. And, and you point out three intellectual influences. Uh, first, it's the classical theory, so the Ricardo story, and you also put Mill in that as a, sort of the basis of his economic thinking. So this is not his institutional thinking, but his economic thought economic theory. You add his evolutionary theory, which is extremely important and extremely transformative. I mean, this whole um, physics and politics and his English constitution that comes out of that sort of embrace of Darwin. But you say that the Marxist revolution of Jevons was not transformative, that he was still um, a defender of the classical school, and that he had to contend with this marginalist school that has risen. And this is the part I might take issue with um, and ask you to think, not think about it, but maybe maybe add an extra layer on that, on that story. Um, so for, I don't know how many, oops. You have like eight more minutes, Gonzalo, eight more minutes. Here we go. Um, so, his major works, uh, you've already summarized it. I like the way you paired the English Constitutions, Physics and Politics, Lombard Street, and Economic Studies as, as sort of these pairs that you work together. And these are just some other uh, of the date. The only thing, reason I'm... Gonzalo, sorry to interrupt. I think that we, we, we still see the second slide, and you are talking about the third. Okay, so I'm doing something wrong here. Uh, you still see the second slide? Yep. Maybe it's easier to go this way then. Sorry, how, is this better? Yes, thank you. Okay. My date is slightly different from yours because I'm putting when he started writing it rather than when he finished it. So uh, the process of the English political economy, which is started in 1976, is actually the beginning of the economic studies. So it's not entirely posthumous. He had actually published a little part of that before. So you, you would talk about these as follow-ups and, and companion pieces after the major uh, works. So physics and politics following English constitution. Economic studies following Lombard Street. It makes perfect sense. It's, it's wonderfully written in, in your paper and explained. My issue is, again, on his role uh, his position as a classical economist. Um, now, the normal way of thinking uh, when we talk about the history of economic thought is think that there's a linear system of British political economy, where you have the classical school and Carter, Senior Mill, and a whole bunch of other people before the 70s, and then there's this marginalist revolution in 1871. And then everybody's new class. So, so at least after something else. I have uh I don't see 19th century British economics that way. I see it as more as a, a multi-pronged, a multi-linear system. Before 1871, that sort of adjusts afterwards after 1871. So the, the difficulty with calling um Badgett, a classical economist, is that puts him as sort of a defender of the classical system against the marginalists. But the, the classical system was already under attack from other branches. It was being attacked by the so-called catalactic school. This is uh, of Waitley and Senior. And it was attacked by the empiricist school, Weevil, Jones, and the statistician. But Badgett writes um, a bit about uh, some of these. Um, now, I've placed, now where does one place Badgett? Now, after 1871, yes, there's a Marxist revolution, Hugh Jevons wrote his work, 
and and there is a bit of conflict with Cairns and Fawcett still sort of defending the classical system, then Jevons and Edward Dixty sort of attacking the classical system. And then Marshall sort of puts it together and comes up with this neoclassical. So I, I think it's a bit difficult or a bit premature to say that before the 1890s, there was such a thing as an orthodoxy, that is a, new, a neoclassical orthodoxy. Jevons was a revolutionary at that stage. This was, there was one book before, before Badgett died in 1877, there was really only one book on marginalist economics, and that was Jevons, and it was a very confused piece of work and very difficult to read, and very few people read it. So it's it, there's a, there's a sense maybe in your work where you're maybe anticipating how neoclassical economics is going to develop, but I don't think that was necessarily a foregone conclusion. But where does Badgett fit in all this? Is Badgett like Kearns and Fawcett trying to just fend off the neoclassical revolution, or is he somewhere else? And my interpretation of it, just going back, and he forced me to go back and, and take a peek again at Badgett's writings. I decided to place him actually as an inheritor of the Catalactic School. So an inheritor of Senior and Whateley and that a tradition that was always, that was never quite classical, never quite mill, but a bit anti-mill. But defensive of the attacks that were done by the statisticians. And this is something that you can see in Badgett. Badgett dismisses these statisticians as just these people who absolutely refuse to abstract, absolutely institutional, don't want to talk about theory at all. Now, before I read your work, I had the impression, and I'm sure a lot of people do, that that Badgett was just an institutional writer. You know, he wrote on banking, and that was it. I mean, what theory does he have? What theoretical outlook does he have? So I would assume that he would be with this empiricist historical school. But no, he's not. But he's not exactly in the classical school either. He's sort of an is in between position, free marginalist, but of the same stream that we later led to the marginalists. So this Catalan school feeds into Jevons, feeds into Badgett, but whereas Jevons is a revolutionary, Badgett is less than revolutionary, but he's he's drawing from that same well. Um, so this is why I think a little bit of his youth is important to focus on. Now, now Badgett was 10 years older than Jevons, as you say, he sort of introduced him to his first job. He had admiration for Jevons, as it were. Um, but Jevons was a radical. Jevons was conscious he was doing revolutions, that he was overthrowing Mill and all that stuff. Uh, whereas Badger didn't want to go that far. But the interesting thing is they have this very similar background, and they hang out with the same people. So they both come from the UCL, both had the same teachers, Augustus de Morgan and Nassau William Senior, were the people who taught them. Well, de Morgan taught him his math, Senior taught him his, his economics. Um, they moved in the same unitic. Badgett was not a Unitarian, but he was a nonconformist. But there was a Unitarian circle around the UFCL and LMC with James Martineau, R.H. Hutton, who, as you point out, was Badgett's collaborator, lifelong friend. And Hutton was, and Jevons and Dixie, even though they're much younger, were part of that Martineau Hutton crowd. Badgett, during the 50s, contributed to these Unitarian magazines. He was, he, uh, James Martineau was the founder of the National Review, and he was the editor of the National Review. But even though he wasn't Unitarian himself, he was nonconformist, and he was very much in this crowd. And this crowd is the crowd that created the sort of the Catal was the Catalactic crowd. And sort of the intellectual influence there is not Ricardo. It's Nassau William Sr. And it's not Mill, but it's Nice Sr.'s Outlines of Political Economy. And it, it's, and now the term catalactic may, may be unusual, but it's sort of, it takes classical theory, but dumps a lot of it, or it picks and, picks, picks, uh, picks and chooses parts of it. It dumped the labor theory of value. And this is something you don't see in this in, 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 in Badgett's economic studies, even in his criticisms of Mill. He doesn't really embrace the labor theory of values. That's just not necessary. Uh, they discard Malthus, they discard the wages fund. There's a part you talk about it. And then when I went back and looked, there's 1848 uh, paper on it. There's a lot in there. And this is um, 
Badgett just coming after reading uh, uh, Senior and immediately attacking Mill's treatise. And this is the main thing of the Catalanca. They were all really anti-Mill. Not so much anti-Ricardo. They're okay with Ricardo. But it's Mill. Mill's restatement was the part that they didn't like. Um, the Catalanists, uh, uh, the proverb here, wanted to limit the scope of economics to market institutions only. This is another point you point out in the paper, that he wanted really to emphasize the market institutions, that economics not applicable to everything in the way Mill wanted to do it, but sort of narrow it to these market institutions, institutions of exchange or important. And they always have an emphasis on exchange, not production as the term of the value. And so this, again, reminded me of your discussion when you're talking about the money value and sort of the idea of these dealers creating that or determining prices, which is not something that a proper Ricardian build type would do. So for Badgett to have this sort of economic vision, it's not coming from Ricardo, properly speaking, and it's definitely not coming from Mill, but it is coming from Senior. Other things that have this crowd, this Unitarian crowd, is, is the trade cycle theory, the currency questions. De, Augustus de Morgan wrote on currency, and uh, Badgett's International Currency, um, a book that's practically, you know, taken from de Morgan, uh, stuff on currency. It just copies a lot of the arguments of it and sort of addresses them. And they all embraced uh, Darwin's evolution, evolution theory. So, my interest is finding out to what extent did Badgett actually acknowledge this influence from Senior? His outlines of political content, was that his real textbook? Well, I poked around and then I found that he actually wrote a little thing on Senior. And, um, and I, I just put these little, three little quotes here because I, I think they're, they're illustrated. Uh, one, the, the first one is. Uh, when he talks about Senior as a person, he says that Senior scattered and wasted in a semi-abstract discussion of practical topics, powers which were fit to have produced a lasting and considerable work of philosophy. I like that phrase because I don't think necessarily that he's talking about Senior only. He might be talking about himself. That if he didn't have all these practical problems, he would sit down and write that lasting and considerable work of philosophy that he always wanted to do. And this is what you really bring out with this three with, with this projected for three volume economic studies. Uh, he confesses that Senior was basically a professor. Uh, he was the one who examined him. He was the one who taught uh, who, who who did the, the exam. He's an external examiner. He wasn't a professor at UCL, but he did the exams and set the curriculum at UCL. So the outlines of political economy is where Badgett would have got his economic theory from. Which is a, a variation on Ricardo. It's not actually Ricardo, it's definitely not Mill. And then he's got these three points that he talks about senior. And again, these are points that you raised in your, in, in, well, two of the, of the three points are the ones you actually raised in your thing. To teach that profit has no tendency to become equal in different grades. Point of emphasis that senior makes. The Ricardo theory of rent was a, so these are, he's saying are misconceptions that people are talking about in his days. So this is the 1870s. Um, that the recurring theory of rent was a blundering misconception. This is one of the things the statisticians talk about, and he starts that. And then he's got this little take here, which is unnecessary for bankers to keep a stock of gold or silver to meet their liabilities, but that they should buy the gold in the market when they wanted it. And if, if Junior heard that, he would be aghast. So it, it's, I like the whole tendency of equalization of profit, because you bring that up. I didn't know at all that Senior talked about the consumers being liabilities. So it's an interesting you know, take on that. Yeah, now, he doesn't quote Senior in his own work. He just mentions him once in his economic studies. Um, but it seems, at least from the economics of Gonzalo, uh, please conclude because we are running out of time. Oh, sorry. OK, this is going to be a very short. So it, it, it just seems that he, he, he seems to adopt a lot of the similar arguments that Senior adopts, a lot of some criticisms of Mill that Senior adopts. When he talks about Mill, he's, he, he throws a huge catalactic critique of it against wages, machinery, labor demand, population, again, just out, everything out of the outlines. He wrote that essay on Mill right after he finished his exam using the outlines. 
when he talks about Cairns, even though he talks about him a little bit okay in economic studies, he also dismisses him as an ivory tower abstract with no practical experience. He dismisses Mill, the whole thing on scope and hypothesis, you also bring that up. Again, this is a very senior-like attack. I'm also wondering also just in the back of my head is, is if he's aware of McLeod's elements banking, which sort of came out toward, toward, towards the end of his life, because McLeod also was part of the Pestalactic crowd, although not as intimately as the others. But he also very much had that similar outlook. Um, now, as you said, you know, Badgett died at 51, which is very premature. So he ended up not writing his lasting and considerable work that he would have loved to have written, uh, that he was planning to write, as you put. And maybe, you know, that, as that quote said, he was thinking about it. And I would say he did not really witness the rise of classical economics. That comes a little much, I think, a little later than before his death. In 77, it's still too early to talk about there being any classical orthodoxy yet. He missed out on the Long Depression. He missed out on the rise of the anti-liberal tariff movement. So there's certain interesting things that, if you ever want to do an alternate history, Barry, what would Badgett have reacted to, you know, as the world have changed through, this, through the 80s, uh, through the late 70s and the 80s? Um, and he didn't have a political career, which is something you, you point out as, as you always want to do. So my last sort of point is just also ask, and this is not for this project, maybe it's another project in the future. Uh, I, I'm not sure how familiar you are with George Goshen, who was also a banker, a little younger, just a couple of years younger than Badgett. And he ended up being elected. Um, so Badgett has a review of his theory of foreign exchanges, and he lauds Goshen. Uh, but Goshen, unlike Badger, did get elected to parliament, ended up being a minister and chancellor and all this political power. And he seems to have very much very similar opinions to Badger. Um, and you know, Goshen, I guess, was the alter ego that Badger could have been if he'd gone down the political route. Um, and maybe there's maybe a or some project in the future if you want to do uh, a compare and contrast between the careers of these two men, which come from very similar backgrounds. And, have similar, very similar opinions. Um, so that's essentially my comment. I just want to say I Thank really you. enjoy this paper. And you really had me scrambling to think about where would I fit? Where should he fit in the economic field? And, and he's, he's a lot more richer character than I thought he would be. I thought he would just simply be an institutionalist. No, no, he, was, he has arguments that are very subtle and very clear. He's not as radical as Jevons, but he draws from that well. He just doesn't go that far. There's something about the youthful uh, revolutionary element of Jevons that's just not in magic. But the same critiques of Mill, that same revulsion to what Mill was trying to do. Sorry, thanks. No, 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 there's no, no need to sorry. Uh, Barry, I assume that you have some comments on the discussion. Um, a little bit, a little bit. Mostly, I, I, I think maybe I need, I need to do a little more work on the paper. I mean, a lot of these characters, I, I don't, you know, I, 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 I wrote this paper in a hurry, <laughs> and I, uh, and I, as I say, Badgett was not who I expected. Okay, and so I have tried to say, well, what, what now do I see in Badgett? Okay, and I'm not surprised that having changed that frame, Gonzalo now sees more things, you know, and, and so maybe there needs to be a second paper. I need to somehow finish this one. But uh, let me just, just highlight a few things. Um, I, I, I would not say that it was the French indemnity that made Badgett um, sort of focus on international stuff. He's very aware that London is the is the world capital market, you know, that he says that thing about if any country wants to raise money for a railroad, they come to London. This is before this is before the French indemnity, but the French indemnity is so huge, you know, that that is a pivot, that is a game changer. They came to London because the international capital market was already in London, you know. So that's what that that is, you know, it's not really a correction, but it's 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 pushing it earlier that he already could see. He himself is a country banker, so the international with no international banking, you know. But as the editor of the Economist, his his the people who subscribe to his journal are in that world, and so that's where he. So he is in London. He's part. He, he's swimming in those in those waters. Second point, 
maybe I said in, in the paper, I make more of this than maybe I did in the presentation. I really think that he wanted to be Ricardo. Okay. He, in the sense that he wanted to write a principles of political economy, he wanted to, he made a gazillion dollars in the money market. Um, and now he wanted to retire and write his treatise. You know, I think that was, that's what makes sense for me in a biographical sense. Maybe he wanted to be Goshen, po po possibly that's, that's right. But it was Ricardo and he was, you know, he, he called himself anti-mill, not, not, A-N-T-E, before Mill, meaning that he does not like the direction that Mill is taking things. And in particular, he thinks Mill has exaggerated English political economy and has done damage to it, you know, by treating it as a universal theory. OK, um, I don't you know, I'm not aware of these catalytic people. OK, so you're making me aware of them. So possibly he was, you know, he did identify with them and they were they were uh, friends, friends of his fellow fellow travelers. Um, and I will look at some of these, some of these things. The um, let me, uh, I guess what I would the takeaway that I want to leave in this paper, okay, is that I the counterfactual for me for Badgett not dying at fifty one is would the neoclassical revolution have been so so complete, okay? Had Badgett been there to say, now, wait a minute, now, wait a minute, you know, that's not the way it is. Because these people, Marshall and Jevons, they know that Badgett knows stuff that they don't know. OK. And if he had said, wait a minute, you know, that's I think history might have been different, you know, and uh, it, it was not the fact that he was off the you know, remember, you don't mention it. I didn't mention it that. Um, Badgett's widow um, appealed to Marshall to write a forward to the postulates of English political economy, which he did, a very nice little forward, which he kind of then rejected later, you know, that he just did it, you know, but in fact, that is a counter to Marshall, really, you know, and Marshall did not have the confidence that he was going to be the leader of this new school, you know, at that time, you know, he came to have that confidence, you know, and it was because in part Badgett was not on the scene, Badgett was gone. Um, and so that's the story. So possibly Badgett would have been a leader of the Cadillac school or something that, uh, that, that might've been, that might've been. So I think that's quite interesting. Um, and I just have to have to think about, think about that. Um, do you have an answer for my query? Why is this article not in the collected works? Did you read it? Did you read it? Could, you know, it's it does read like Badgett, um, but it makes me think I should read the review of Goshen, okay, and see, you know, th that maybe Goshen wrote it, okay, and that Giffen is in fact attributing it to Badgett for his own reasons. That's what David Laidler thinks. He thinks that maybe Giffen had an agenda that he wanted to put Badgett's name on it because that's a brand, you know, that you can really do something with. Um, and so I, I, I'm going to look into that. I'm going to look into Gosh. It could I, be a possible I author. No, I, I thought it was pretty accepted that it was Badgett's paper. But that's just because it's published in the Economic Journal. That's the danger, right? Yeah. It's only the second volume, by the way, of this of the Economic Journal. The Economic Journal we now think of as, oh, this is the Royal Society. You know, that was not the, you know, this was 1892, right? So it's, we shouldn't be thinking that way. So I'm gonna poke into this a little more. Thank you so much, Gonzalo. Um, this is, I couldn't have hoped for better than this. Oh, this was um, a lot of fun. I really yeah. enjoyed this paper a lot. It really got me thinking. It's, it's exploring, it, it's much more exciting. So Thank may may I suggest that if you give me two minutes to go get my my uh, liquidity, <laughs> I agree. To, I agree with your to uh, restore suggestion. my liquidity. I will then come back. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I thank you. Go, yeah. go to have your liquidity, and uh, I think that we should stop the recording and we will continue in two minutes.